Good evening. Welcome to our August Prince of Wales private update on managing neurological pain in general practice. Our first speaker is Dr. Raj Reddy. Dr. Reddy is a neurosurgeon and will be speaking on managing cervical pain. Thank you, Dr. Reddy. Uh, good evening all. My name is Raj Reddy. I'm a neurosurgeon with a practice uh, that encompasses both cranial and spinal surgery in both adults and children. Now, patients with neck as well as low back pain will be very common presentations in most of your practices. Understanding the surgical perspective of this heterogeneous group of conditions will certainly enhance your patient care. Now, Now, treating spine conditions can be very difficult to understand. Similar patients seem to have very different operations. Similar operations seem to happen to very different patients. And as surgeons, we don't always uh, explain exactly why we're doing what we're doing as well as uh, we could. So today I'd like to provide you on an overview on complex spine surgery. In short, I wanna give you an idea of why we end up with a patient like this. Now, these are the goals that I'd like us to achieve by the end of the talk, uh, assessment of these patients, identification of uh, red flags, particularly things that may require specialist review uh, or referral to a hospital emergency department, and also a broad uh, understanding of treatment options without going into the, the nitty gritty detail, but again, just to have an idea, especially when your patients start to ask you some questions. Now, I'll use an interesting case study to uh, illustrate a number of important points. Um, and we'll also cover the learning objectives that might be a little bit more didactic. Now, going back to our friend here, how did we end up here? Well, this was a gentleman I looked after from uh, a few years ago from actually uh, interstate. Um, he was a 56 year old IT professional. He was otherwise very fit and well, very active, avid cyclist, uh, surfer, um, skier. And he had a two week history of neck pain and it started about two weeks after he'd had dental treatment for a tooth abscess. Now, after the initial management by his uh, local doctor without improvement, he was sent to the emergency department for further assessment. And after they assessed him, uh, they obtained some imaging, they obtained a CT scan as you would see here. Now, CT is a very reasonable modality to uh, commence investigating the spine. It's certainly something we'd all be familiar with as you have easy access to it. It's cheap to access, it's quick. Um, MRIs, usually you need a specialist to help uh, organize. And whilst it does pick up the majority of pathology, it's important to also have in the back of your mind some of its limitations. So it's very good at bones. It's not as good as an MRI at soft tissue, but it can give you a bit of an idea. Now, if you looked at this as a 56 year old middle-aged man, uh, you'd probably say it actually doesn't look too bad. There are some mild degenerative changes, some uh, loss of disc height, uh, some irregularity of the vertebra with osteophyte formation, but it actually doesn't look you know, that bad at all. So he was given analgesics, he was reassured, he was sent home. Um, and when he got home, he actually didn't get better and he gradually got worse, increasing neck pain. And then he began to notice some changes in his upper limb function and then started to develop fevers, chills, rigors. And with this deterioration, he then went back to the emergency department and was re-imaged. So this was his progress CT scan. And there's, a, there's been a marked change. And I'll put the two scans up side by side. The left is the old scan, the right is a new scan. And what you can see is there looks like there's been destruction of the vertebral bodies. There's been destruction of the discs. There's been a change in the alignment. And with all of these things going on, you can start to maybe uh, draw the conclusions. There may be some instability. There may be some compression of the spinal cord. And so this led to further investigation. The patient had an MRI. These are two sequences from that MRI. Um, on the left uh, is what we call the T2 sequence. On the right, there has been some contrast administered. And you can see that, again, we're seeing what we saw in the um, CT scan. We can now see the spinal cord being compressed, and we can now see that there is quite a significant retropharyngeal uh, or prevertebral collection. So this is severe infection. It's probably as bad as you'll see in a first world country like Australia, uh, involving multiple levels in the spine. Now, 
sometimes when people present cases, you can sort of look at things and think it's easy to be critical in retrospect. However, I, I don't think that way. I think this could happen to any one of us. And I think it does, however, illustrate a number of really important points. And I use this case in talks from medical school uh, to, to specialists, because I think these are fundamentals that we sometimes uh, lose track of. So what we get taught in medical school is take a good history and examination. And that's the fundamental of uh, clinical practice. But I think it's also really important to pay attention to the history you've obtained. And I think this is probably one of the first things you, you start to, when you start thinking of red flags, this should be where you, you, know, you start. And you develop a lot of this with uh, you know, your clinical acumen, with experience. But if you stop and analyze why you're doing what you're doing, this, this helps you, I think. So paying attention to the history is that we have a fit and well-motivated professional seeking help for neck pain. Now, this is the kind of person, particularly a sporting person, who is used to hurt, you know, part of training and exercising is pain. So for someone like this to actually seek medical review for pain, that should actually be the very first red flag. It's not the kind of person that you expect. The second thing is the temporal history of the infection that he's had, the dental infection and the intervention. And whilst it was documented and mentioned, it seems to have just fallen under the radar. And so therefore, this leads to the next really important learning point, investigation. You should always consider what investigation you're ordering, what information it tells you, what diagnosis will help you achieve. Um, so as I said, CT is a great initial test, but it has limitations. That doesn't mean everyone needs an MRI. Uh, but to me, it does lead to the next two points. Um, again, in my practice, I'm sure in your practice, there's an expectation for us to have all the answers immediately. And that's not often the case. Um, look, my father was a GP, so I grew up knowing the challenges that GPs face. And I think, you know, you're expected to know everything about every condition, which is not possible. Um, and the way you can sort of make sure you're not missing things is to have great follow-up, uh, because sometimes time is what helps us make our diagnosis. So I think it's important to have that clinical follow-up. And it's also important to have radiographic follow-up. Uh, because if you think of a guy with a normal CT scan that continues to have neck pain, then you need to start thinking what else could be going on and what other tests might I need to obtain? Maybe not as a first line investigation, but as the second or third line investigation. So I think those are really important points that will help you with that red flag identification. Now, when we think of spine conditions, we can start thinking of the symptoms that uh, they cause in our patients. And these can be broad, uh, these can be grouped into a few uh, categories. So radiculopathy is very common. Radiculopathy can be sensory, such as uh, numbness, paresthesia, pain. It can be motor, such as weakness. Myelopathy is uh, a group of symptoms that is quite insidious and sometimes can be quite uh, elusive in terms of a diagnosis. And again, sometimes it advances before you pick it up. The very early signs are sort of loss of dexterity uh, and fine motor skills and upper or lower limbs. It then progresses to varying types of pain um, and then loss of function. Now, this typically happens in an older age group of people who sometimes just assume this is part of you know, aging. Neck pain, mechanical neck pain uh, are all common symptoms. And then you can have a combination of any of the above. <clears throat> now, in terms of management, it does help uh, if you start thinking of the sources of the pain. And I'm going to stratify these into a few groups. The first is to think of the uh, anatomy. Um, so pain can arise from any of the structures in your neck, from the discs, from the facet joints, from the muscles, tendons, ligaments, uh, and other structures. And this can also give you a clue to the type of pain. Um, a, a disc bulge with an annular tear can cause mechanical pain. A disc herniation pinching a nerve can cause radicular symptoms. A broader disc pushing on the spinal cord can cause myelopathy. So each of these has slightly different characteristics. The pathology behind uh, the, pa the patient's uh, condition can also uh, help you identify the pain. So degenerative conditions are one of the most common uh, conditions that you look after. And you can see on this CT scan that this is an 83-year-old gentleman. There's loss of disc height. There's a spondylolisthesis. There's osteophyte formation. This can lead to inflammation. And so these are the types of pathological sources of pain. This is a bone scan. Uh, I like this as an investigation because if there is convincing, convincing inflammation, you'll see uptake like these hotspots here at L5S1 in the sacroiliac joint, uh, as well as some of the facet joints. There are congenital, uh, this is a, uh, sorry, trauma. So here we have an L2 burst fracture, a T9 fracture, obvious source of pain, 
you'd also have the history that goes with this to help you with your diagnosis. Um, and then we have congenital uh, causes of pain, such as this um, high-grade spondylolisthesis where you have the L5 vertebra almost falling off uh, S1 and infection, as, as we know from our case study. Now, right at the bottom, I put psychosomatic. This certainly accounts for a lot of um, pain uh, and everyone has a different pain threshold and pain is such a complex thing in terms of the psychology behind it, but it should in some ways always be the diagnosis of exclusion, uh, just so that you're not missing any of the other causes. Another thing about causes of uh, spine pain is that the spine is a mobile organ and therefore abnormal movement can also be a source of pain. So instability uh, can be a source of pain, um, congenital uh, sort of um, connective tissue disorders can lead to hypermobility of joints. Uh, when we think of our modern computer age where we're all sitting in front of computers or using iPhones, postural changes can cause pain. And as you get older, deconditioning and loss of strength can also uh, cause uh, pain. Now we move on to the red flags, and I apologize for this busy slide. Um, as you can see, most uh, of these are also very common uh, with other neurological conditions, also medical conditions. And these are really the symptoms and signs that should raise your suspicion about sinister pathology. They should lead to further investigation to have a diagnosis um, and the cause of the, and, and potentially lead to specialist referral or referral to an emergency department. Um, I think it, it's probably good if you can in your practice have uh, specialists that you can call if you need to. Um, for quick advice, to run a few of these things if you've got a, a patient you're not sure about, to find out what they think might be the next uh, investigation that's going to help in terms of your patient care, and especially in terms of the red flags, what are you trying to not miss, what, what else can you do? Now, going back to our, our patient, what problems does this patient have? Well, if we think very simply, he's got severe infection, there's deformity of the spine, there's compression of the neural structures because of that, and therefore uh, instability. And this leads us to the goals of spine surgery, um, which is decompression of compressed neural elements, realignment of the spine, and providing stability. And if you really think about it, every spine operation that we do involves achieving one of these goals or a combination of them. And some of the operations that we use, uh, th this is a little overview, and I'm sure you've seen this in uh, clinic referral letter, in letters back to yourself, in operation reports. Very quickly, it becomes alphabet soup. However, it's not that complex, and this is just a very brief overview of how you classify that. We have anterior operations, we have posterior operations, fix F stands for fixation and fusion. Um, and you can group them into certain groups. So these are all posterior operations, a posterior lumbar fusion, a posterior lumbar interbody fusion, uh, a transforaminal uh, fusion. Uh, we've got our anterior or oblique approaches, our lateral approaches, and I'll move on to uh, what we're doing in the somatic spine. So simply, you can think of an anterior approach, a posterior approach, or a lateral approach. Each of these has certain advantages and disadvantages. Each allows you to achieve certain goals and therefore are better uh, for certain pathology or conditions. Now, the anterior cervical discectomy infusion is the workhorse of most uh, modern cervical spine surgery. It's one of my favorite types of operations. Um, a 30 second overview is that the patient is put under a general anesthetic. Uh, they have a small incision made uh, in the front of their neck, either along a skin crease or along the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Um, Dissection is carried out between the esophagus and trachea on one side, the coronal artery and jugular vein on the other. So some important real estate. Once we're at the front of the spine, we then remove the affected discs. Uh, we sometimes may remove the entire vertebral body. Uh, we decompress the spinal cord and nerves, and then we reconstruct the spine with either um, uh, cages or implants, uh, or even sometimes even the patient's own bone. It's a very elegant operation in terms of the anatomical dissection. There's minimal muscle damage. The patients have very little wound pain, but you're dealing with some complex and critical anatomy. So it's something that maybe not every surgeon is as au fait with, but it's something that most operations for the cervical spine would involve this. A variation of this is to do an anterior cervical discectomy and total disc replacement. These are a number of implants on the market. Obviously, every company tells you that theirs are the best. But really what's more important is picking the appropriate patient, the indications, and they're very similar to anterior cervical discectomy and fusions in terms of their outcomes. 
Now, the rationale for disk replacement isn't necessarily just to preserve motion, as you can see here, but it's actually to shield the stress uh, on the adjacent levels. These devices, they're mechanical devices, they're mobile devices, they aren't perfect, and so they can fail, and therefore they need much longer term monitoring and follow-up than a fusion. So that's one of the downsides. Now, posterior approaches uh, can also be used for the spine. Um, we can either do simple decompressions, such as a laminectomy of the spinal cord of the individual nerve roots, uh, or we can also do this in association with a fixation and fusion. Um, and that helps us achieve uh, different goals. These are typically a bit more painful in terms of operations. Many segments can also be treated uh, quickly, uh, but you can't approach uh, anterior pathology very well. Now we're on the home stretch. This last section is to give you a brief overview on decision making uh, as to procedural choice, and some of it relates to what I've just, uh, described above in my crew of options. So an important consideration is really the direction of the pathology. Anterior pathology is best treated from an anterior approach and posterior from a posterior approach. Some pathology needs a combined approach. So this patient with multiple spinal fractures, they needed a long segment fusion, which can be best done from a posterior approach. This patient, you can see, has near complete uh, destruction of this vertebral body. Uh, there's a pathological fracture. This patient has metastatic cancer. There's going to be some degree of compression of the spinal cord and it's at imminent risk. So this needs uh, a major operation where you're essentially, in addition to treating the tumor with resecting it, you're reconstructing the spine. So this needed uh, almost a 360 degree operation. So these are the pedicle screws. Uh, to provide the posterior stability. Using the posterior approach, we could remove some of the ribs. These are the lungs underneath the pleura. Uh, we've resected the vertebral body and the cancer. We've put in an expandable custom uh, cage to provide that anterior stability, and we've decompressed circumferentially the spinal cord. The above case also highlights the importance of understanding and taking into consideration the biomechanics, because you don't want to overload the implants and the hardware that, that you're putting in. Now we come to ergonomics and look, operating on a patient such as this carries many challenges. Um, sometimes uh, it's a compromise. Now this was something I approached from a posterior point of uh, view, but sometimes a lateral approach might be better where you can let the abdomen fall out of the way and uh, get a more direct approach to the spine. And lastly, decision-making, there, there's a degree of logistics. What equipments you have, um, theater time availability, whether you need other surgeons to help you with your access. Now I'd like to complete by going back to our case study. And as I said before, we've got uh, issues of infection, neural compression, deformity, and instability. And that helps us understand the operation that this man needed. He needed the infection treated. And as you know, with pus, we've got to evacuate it. So with infection, particularly when it's involving certain structures, you've got to remove them. So he needed a, a four level uh, corpectomy, removing the viral bodies, removing the discs. Then he needed the reconstruction. And what we use is a bit of his own iliac crest. And this is a CT scan. And if I just scroll through, we'll see that there's this piece of long piece of bone that we've used to replace the vertebra. And this is a very long segment just to do from the front, which is why we've also put in the posterior hardware to provide that stability. So we tick the three goals of uh, decompression, realignment, and providing stability. Now, this is a major operation. And, you know, obviously, as GPs, you will see these people a lot more than some of the other specialties that I showed this talk to. Um, but it does surprise me how well some of our patients recover. Um, so this is this particular patient. Obviously, I have his consent because I've uh, recorded it. And following the surgery, this is what movement he has. Now, not every patient will have this degree of mobility, but this is you know pretty close to his baseline. The incision, I mentioned anterior cervical incisions heal incredibly well. Obviously, uh, I'm cheating with a bit of lighting here. But even then, I think the, the bit that you can see very clearly, it extends up to uh, a bit further north. It actually, it, it, it's almost unnoticeable. Now, more important than just simply the outcomes, there's also a functional outcome. And this man is very active. And I'm pleased to report that he's managed to get back to most of his previous activities. In fact, sometimes I'm a little bit worried, especially when he likes so many Christmas cards, such as this one or this one. Back in a time when we could travel, he used to jump out of helicopters and go heli skiing, and he was still able to continue to do that. So the take home messages, 
beware of and look for the red flags. Um, really, neurological deficits, particularly as a neurosurgeon, spine surgeon, should really uh, drive your um, imaging and specialist referral. It's really important, um, and I didn't go into this just because of time constraints, and I know that uh, Dr. Aurora will cover some of this, that not all treatment algorithms will end with surgery. And the last point is that surgical intervention, as you've seen for a select group of patients, is incredibly, incredibly effective. Um, thank you. So look, um, there are a couple of, um, I might just stop screen, uh, sharing the screen, and there are a couple of questions. Um, the first is, when do you consider um, steroid injection for degenerative pain? So I think that's a, a very good question. And when you think of a steroid injection, there are a number of targets you can use. In the cervical spine, the two targets you'd be using for a steroid injection is either the facet joint or a nerve block. Um, so those are two types. In the lumbar spine, you would have those, but you would also have um, a, an epidural injection. Now, I think it's a very good part of your treatment uh, strategy. And I always tell patients it's a, a gradiated stepwise approach. You start off with maximizing your non-operative treatment, um, which I think Dr. Aurora, Aurora will cover. You then move forward to analgesics, simple, try and avoid opioids. You then try your targeted cortisone injections, and then you start thinking about surgery in the absence of red flags. With um, steroid injections, uh, if I'm using a facet joint injection for neck pain, I like to get a spec scan to highlight targets that will give you the best way to maximize your um, effectiveness. If it's radicular pain, you try and go for the nerves that are the most compressed. If it's diffuse back pain with an annular tear, then in the lumbar spine, I would use an epidural. Um, Another question is, is intervertebral cement still used in any situation? Look, the answer is yes. It's a very effective treatment for certain things. Um, those of you may know that there was a study done which looked at trying to debunk it. I think it was not a great study. It didn't really pick a good patient group, nor did it pick good outcomes. Um, but in the right patient, it can. And so the right patient, up to me, has um, three features. The first is they've got a good history of mechanical pain. The second is that their imaging matches that, um, and you see compression occurring or compression fractures. Um, you might even see uh, increased uptake on a bone scan. And the third is that they're fit for the procedure, and maybe other procedures are not better. So to me, it's something in older patients that have compression fractures that are still showing um, uptake on a bone scan, so they're still hot. Um, we sometimes will also use it to provide support for the hardware we put in, because sometimes the hardware is stronger than the bone, and by filling the bone with cement, it gives us better fixation and better stability. Um, next question, is surgery still recommended for patients with worsening scoliosis? Um, look, that's, a, again, a very broad question, and you can break it into, I guess, a few different age groups. You've obviously got the pediatric uh, age group, uh, in which if uh, conservative measures, bracing and other things don't work, surgery is still an option. And that's why they're a more common group of patients that have scoliosis surgery. Um, in adult patients, it does become a little bit more challenging because they don't always recover from these operations as well as a... Uh, a younger patient. I recently consulted on a gentleman in his uh, 70s who had spina bifida, had a fusion uh, for scoliosis when he was uh, 19. They didn't fix his curve, they stabilized it, and he's fused in that uh, question mark kind of shape. And he's now getting symptoms from uh, respiratory compression, uh, which, is, which is usually an indication that you should treat it. The problem is I don't have a great operation for him uh, because he's already fused his entire spine. So someone who hasn't had an operation that develops visceral uh, uh, compression, um, it, you can get gastric compression, so it can affect uh, you know, organs. You would think of, uh, if they're a surgical candidate, you would think of uh, fixing uh, a worsening scoliosis. I try not to operate on worsening scoliosis just for pain, particularly in young sort of 20, 30 year olds because I don't think they do quite as well. I think the trade-off you get in terms of the stiffness and therefore potential loss of function, as well as the, the future potential for adjacent segment disease, they're not gonna be thanking you for it. Um, any other questions?
it's a, as, as I said, um, probably a point I made earlier, it's, it's a large group of patients. Uh, it can be challenging. Um, one of the things, this is a little bit philosophical, in uh, 2021, in, in our country, people don't expect to be in pain. Um, and unfortunately, pain is a part of life. And we can't always eradicate it, but we can certainly investigate it to fix the important things that can be fixed and try and come up with you know, other strategies for things that can't be fixed with surgery. So thank you very much, Dr. Reddy. And we um, might move on now to Dr. Peter Wilson. He is a neurosurgeon and will be speaking on managing cranial pain. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Hello, thanks for the introduction. I'll just share my screen there. All right, so cranial pain is quite a, quite a big topic. Uh, I'll try to focus on what interests me as a neurosurgeon and what would concern you, particularly in regards to what you don't want to miss in your, um, your personal practices. So headaches uh, is a type of cranial pain. It's not the only type of cranial pain per se, uh, but it's extremely common. Uh, there is quoted figures of 48.9% of uh, the community having headaches at any one point in time. And generally, people will have headaches. Ninety-five percent, ninety-five percent of the population will have a headache at some point in their life. I do see occasionally patients who say they're just not a headachey person, and so that would be a first uh, concerning point. But headaches are extremely, extremely common, as I'm sure everyone here knows. Uh, to put it in perspective, the one-year risk of a malignant brain tumor is 0.045 percent. As a neurosurgeon, we certainly see these cases. Um, to give you an idea of the epidemiology, there should be a neurosurgeon for every 100,000 people or so. A GBM, which is a malignant brain tumour or a glioblastoma, it happens about five per 100,000 people per year. So relatively uh, uncommon, but certainly you don't want to miss it. 90% uh, of the time, there won't be an underlying lesion, uh, but sometimes in, there can be what's called a secondary headache where there is an underlying cause and that's less than 10% of the time. The challenge is to not miss a significant pathology. You want to be sensitive in your clinical decision making, uh, but you don't want to uh, over investigate patients as well. And there's a big crackdown on, uh, particularly in the community, GPs doing CTs and MRIs for headaches. Um, ultimately, sometimes imaging is the only way to truly identify what is going on. So the first thing I would say is to watch out for red flags. These are the patients you really don't want to miss. Uh, that's because red flags generally represent a dangerous or a progressive pathology. Uh, and often the prognosis can be better with early intervention. And this usually re uh, relates to structural lesions. Uh, so infection is a big one because they can be fairly rapidly progressive. Neoplasms uh, sooner rather than later, maybe weeks to months. Hemorrhage and vascular lesions, again, can be quite rapid. And congenital and acquired lesions uh, may not be uh, progressive, but they can actually be treatable. So I did provide a, um, a reference to the sort of red flags you should look for. This is a fairly exhaustive long list. Uh, I'm not going to be able to cover all of these just in the interest of time and just from the scope of things. Um, sorry, someone in the background there. Um, but I'll try to cover the, the main ones that will be, uh, you don't really don't want to miss in your um, daily practice. So the first one is for if patients have fever or systemic infections, uh, these can be potentially life-threatening if there is associated headache. Uh, not so much from a neurosurgeon's point of view, but from the community point of view, you don't want to miss a meningitis, particularly a bacterial meningitis. And a brain abscess particularly has a very poor natural history, even though they are rare lesions. So brain abscesses are notoriously inconsistent in how they present. Uh, the classical clinical triad of headache, fever, and neurological deficit is actually pretty uncommon. This is one uh, table from a, a fairly large study looking at the frequency of the various symptoms. And you can see there's actually a broad range of symptoms, ultra level of consciousness between 10 and 100%, depending on the study. Um, all these things are signs of concern. Uh, and certainly if they have two or more of these features, you have to be worried and have a low threshold to investigate. Where did the brain abscesses come from? Again, it can be very varied. Uh, up to uh, half the time, it can be from a local disease, such as from sinusitis or middle ear infection or uh, from a dental abscess. Uh, it can be hematogenous, typically from infective endocarditis, but even a small skin abrasion can be enough to set, spread um, bacteria to the brain. Uh, it can be cryptogenic in 40% of the time. We, we don't even know where the infection came from. 
and there can be direct inoculation. So if someone has a laceration that gets infected or a head injury or suddenly post-surgical. Mortality can be quite high, uh, depending on which series you look at. That has improved significantly over the years and decades with better antibiotics, early imaging, and better surgical techniques. Um, generally, the key is early antibiotic to control the infection and stop it from getting worse. The big concern is if the infection spreads and it ruptures into the ventricle, that's a very high mortality. And that's quoted between 80 to 90% uh, risk of mortality when that happens. So radiologically, classically, these are ring enhancing lesions on CT and MRI. Uh, MRI is a bit more sensitive and a bit more clear. You can see uh, that there's a leading edge, which is a little bit less intense uh, here. And that there's a rim of enhancement uh, circumferentially otherwise. There is some T1 hypo intensity around it, which represents some edema. And again, the classic thing for abscess is the diffusion weighted sequences. So uh, more commonly in general practice, you would see diffusion restriction with an infarct and that's because they, the water cells are packed closer together and they can't diffuse normally. And so you get this uh, white spot on what's called the diffusion weighted imaging. Um, you can get T, what's called T2 shine through, such as uh, this white spot here. It's a little bit brighter here, but if you look at the what's called the uh, apparent diffusion coefficient, the ADC, that's bright on the ADC, whereas the true diffusion restriction is dark here. And the way to remember that is the ventricles actually look white because of the T2 shine through. So neoplasms are another one that you really don't want to miss. Um, brain metastases, certainly in adults, are the most common and they represent more than half of intracranial tumors. Uh, interestingly, in 10 to 30 percent of adults with systemic cancer, they will have brain metastases at some point. And they generally are carcinomas, uh, lung, breast, kidney, colorectal, and particularly in Australian melanoma. Uh, it is rarely from the prostate, but that is possible. Uh, I think disproportionately from the number of sheer number of patients who have prostate cancer, a very small number will go to the brain, but certainly I have had patients where uh, prostate cancer can go to the brain. Uh, it's not always surgical management. It generally requires a multiple, multiple disciplinary team in regards to a radiation oncologist, a medical oncologist, and a surgeon. Uh, the key is generally early referral is better and early detection is better because that will give the patient the best chance. Neurological deficit, just like with the spine, is a real red flag. So uh, I'm sure everyone here is very well educated that stroke-like symptoms are somewhat something of an emergency. Uh, time is brain, as they say. And that can be simple things such as speech disturbance, visual disturbance, uh, motor deficit or clumsiness, or sensory disturbance. And that can actually represent a broad range of structural lesions. The key with this is that um, you really can't rely on clinical acumen alone if someone has progressive neurological deficit. I've seen so many times where patients have been managed by other specialists or um, in other hospitals or all over the world where the clinical decision is made to say, look, everything's fine. Oh, no, things are progressive. We don't need to do any scans. Eventually a scan gets done and lo and behold, there's a mass lesion there. In regards to urgent problems, a sudden onset headache or so-called thunderclap headache is uh, an emergency of sorts. These patients stereotypically describe that they have the worst headache of my life and that they've never had a headache this bad before. Uh, it sounds a bit strange, but some patients will actually say spontaneously that they felt like they were hit in the back of the head by a cricket bat. Uh, if they have associated meningism, so typical, typically photophobia, neck stiffness or nausea and vomiting, that raises a concern as well. And the, the real concern there is what's called a subarachnoid hemorrhage. And so you can see on this uh, non-contrast CT, you can see that there's this is the dorsum celli, but this is where the circular villus would be. There's blood throughout the basal cyst, what's called the basal cysts here. This is the midbrain. Uh, and you can see that there's blood all in that subarachnoid space. This is a coronal view of the CT angiogram. And this is the right internal coronal artery branching to the left anterior cere uh, cerebral artery and the right middle cerebral artery. This is what's called a posterior communicating artery here. That's an eminently treatable lesion. Uh, this patient was actually coiled uh, quite successfully. Uh, the story with this young patient in their 20s was they presented to emergency with a headache and collapsed in ED, uh, had this uh, scan identified, came across for coiling. I honestly thought she wasn't going to survive. She's now currently um, awake and alert and just recovering from her hemorrhage. So aneurysm and subarachnoid hemorrhage are of particular interest to neurosurgeons because they can be so unforgiving and such uh, terrifying conditions, really. And the irony is that aneurysms are actually fairly ubiquitous. Three to 4% of the population will have an aneurysm. 
but the annual incidence of subarachnoid hemorrhage is only six per 100,000 per year. So as a neurosurgeon, you'd expect to see about six or so per year. 80% of the time it's aneurysmal, 5% uh, of the time it's lesional. And so if we can't find an aneurysm, we'll look for another lesion such as an AVM or a fistula. The only way to really rule out a fistula is with what's called a DSA, a digital subtraction angiogram. 15% of the time, it will be what's called a parabezing encephalic, and that just means around the midbrain. Um, it's not really understood why this occurs. It's thought to be venous hypertension in the basal system that causes a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, the reality is we do know with these patients that their risk of re-rupture is basically the same as the rest of the community. And the other interesting thing is they do tend to recover significantly faster than an aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. And just to put it in perspective in regards to how dangerous, dangerous an aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage is, a third of people actually will drop dead on the spot. And so it's actually a relatively common cause of sudden death. A third of people will have prolonged disability, whereas a third of people will have full recovery, and that's with maximal treatment. Uh, the other concern is that with an aneurysmal rupture, even if someone has just a mild headache, that if they re-rupture, it can be devastating. Mortality is quoted at about 50%. And from data back in the 80s, we do know that there's about a 4% chance of re-rupturing within the first 24 hours. And it might be after something as simple as just a, what's called a sentinel headache. Uh, it's 1.5% per chance per day for the first two weeks thereafter, which makes up about 20% risk of rupture within two weeks. And you can understand why we're quite keen for these patients to be uh, identified early. So we've got a chance to secure that aneurysm either with clipping or coiling and prevent further rupture. There is a morbidity with clipping and coiling or in the order of 5 to 10%. Uh, really depending on the aneurysm location, local anatomy and other factors. There is some data from a fairly big trial which does show that if there's equipoise as to which is uh, feasible to secure that aneurysm, the short and long-term morbidity and mortality is actually less with the coiling. And so that's how the majority of aneurysms are treated in the 21st century. Uh, raised intracranial pressure is another sign of concern. Uh, this can be related to a mass lesion and it can also not have a mass lesion. And these are stereotypes. This is really from the history more than anything else. These headaches are generally worse with uh, lying flat and when relieved when being upright. Patients often wake up because of the headache because they've been lying flat overnight. And valsalva maneuvers with coughing, seizing and straining will often make the headaches worse. Not all patients have those uh, symptoms or descriptions, but they are relatively common. When I say that there might not be a mass lesion, the energy to be aware of is what's called idiopathic intracranial hypertension or IIH. Uh, it's a little bit of a confusing term. As a medical student, I remember learning about pseudotumor cerebra and didn't really understand what that was. Um, that was thought because they didn't, people didn't really understand why they had these symptoms, even though there was no tumor there. And also benign intracranial hypertension, which has been dismissed because it's really not benign. The reason why that's the case is that patients can actually go blind with prolonged uh, progression. The investigation and diagnosis is a little bit complicated, um, but it is interesting that they can have, again, a broad range of symptoms, but mainly headaches or visual disturbance. There are relatively strict criteria, and basically what it is is they have raised intracranial press pressure with normal CSF, normal imaging, uh, no neurology other than a six nerve palsy, and the key thing is the elevated lumbar puncture opening pressure. And you can see this graph at the bottom that shows as the pressure goes up, they're more likely to have raised intracranial pressure. Chiari malformations are actually a really interesting one as well and something that we see relatively common in the community. Uh, the reason being that their prevalence is quite high, about one in a thousand people will have a Chiari malformation. And again, in medical school, it wasn't really well described what this was. So talk of Arnold Chiari malformations and so forth. In simple terms, there's crowding of the frame of magnum, which is where the brainstem leaves the skull to become the spinal cord. And where you have the cerebellar tonsils, they, they pass down through the frame of magnum and they crowd the frame of magnum to make things a bit tighter than they should be and don't permit normal CSF pulsation. It can have a very broad range of presentations and it can be a completely incidental finding to actually having a broad range of neurological deficits. Uh, interestingly, something that I've come to appreciate is that whilst there may be changes which look impressive on the MRI, that doesn't necessarily correlate with the extent of symptoms. And that's actually been um, shown in a study, I'll show you in a second. So this was a lady in her 40s who had terrible headaches. You know, she couldn't function. She just couldn't get out of bed. She was totally miserable. This is a midline sagittal T1 scan. So you can see the nose here. This is the top of the head. This is the top of the brain. This is the brain stem. This is the cerebellum. This is the frame of magnum here. And you can see there's some cerebellar tonsillar herniation and things are very tight at the level of the frame of magnum. Ultimately, it's a it's a binary decision on how to manage these patients. There's no injection or, or conservative treatment to try to resolve things other than pain management. Basically, surgery involves doing a cut through the back of the, the skin of the neck here, 
removing this bit of bone and decompressing the brain at the base of the uh, skull here. And you can get a good result like this. You can see that there's no pressure on the brainstem or the cerebellum there, and the CSF flow is improved, and the patient symptoms will often improve. In regards to the extent of how far the tonsils go down, so this study was one I was referring to, where it actually showed that if they looked at patients with zero to three millimeters, three to five millimeters, or more than five millimeters, stereotypically, the definition was that it needs to be more than five millimeters. Interestingly, the patients with even a small amount of tonsillar herniation had even more symptoms, uh, and certainly the most pain, which seems to be the most common presentation. And again, this is a table of all the different presentations. Um, there's a huge list of um, potential symptoms and signs here. And I think the takeaway message for Chiari malformation is that if someone reports something that just isn't right, <clears throat> and it's something that's particularly troublesome for them, you have to assume it's a Chiari malformation until proven otherwise. By all means, investigate and try to make sure there's nothing else in the spinal cord and so forth. Um, but you cannot dismiss these patients. And I've seen many patients who have been dismissed by multiple um, other practitioners who have said, you know, these problems you have are not related to Chiari malformation. And when they finally get the diagnosis confirmed and they have their surgery, they're so relieved that someone would listen to them and would actually help try to help them. Post-traumatic headache is another one that you need to be concerned of. Uh, this is a bit more straightforward. So even after a minor trauma, um, the classic one is the extradural hematoma with the concept of talking and dying. Even a small laceration of the squamous temporal bone, which is quite thin on the side of the head, that can actually lacerate the middle meningeal artery and cause a small arterial bleed. The point with that is that the bleeding won't stop until the raised interferon cranial pressure overcomes the systolic blood pressure. So you can have a small lesion, and in young patients particularly, they can actually have just a headache, but not be too bad, be awake and alert and be talking. That blood clot will slowly get bigger and will get to the point where they rapidly deteriorate with a massively raised intracranial pressure, and they will deteriorate very rapidly. So again, if someone has a head injury and they have a persistent headache or there's any concern, you have to err on the side of, of caution that something bad may be going on particularly with a temporal blow. A subdural hematoma, um, such as this one here, this is a patient of mine from a few years ago who was in a remote center, had this acute subdural, we accepted the patient. Uh, he was a bit more headachey when he arrived, so we repeated the scan, and you can see that the subdural hematoma is significantly bigger. Seeing that even though he was awake and alert and following commands, we took him to theater fairly promptly. In the anesthetic bay, as we were getting ready for the operation, he actually deteriorated and lost his level of consciousness. So the anaesthetist was on hand to intubate and we got on with the surgery fairly quickly. And he thankfully survived. So it's something that, you know, if you saw that original scan, you could say, oh, we'll just repeat the scan in a few days, but you really have to treat these, um, these pathologies very seriously. Chronic subdural hematoma, particularly in elderly patients. And the general rule, if it's more than a centimeter thick, uh, generally on the coronal view, they're unlikely to resolve spontaneously. So again, this is a patient who had some mild headaches following his uh, dialysis, um, had a scan done, and then was actually on the bus home because he was felt very well. Uh, there were some frantic calls from the renal physicians to get him back to the hospital because this was identified. Uh, I admitted him over the weekend. Um, he was in two minds about letting him go home because he was so well. He actually had very minor headache, um, really no neurological deficits at all. Um, he was alone at home, so I admitted him. And then over the following few days, he actually got worse, more drowsy, more confused, and we had to wash out those subdurals. And I was very glad that we had admitted him because if he'd gone home, he would have died. So in regards to cranial pain, trigeminal neuralgia is actually more cranial pain rather than headache. Typical trigeminal neuralgia is very unpredictable in regards to its um, occurrences. It can be a static electric shock-like pain. It's consistently in the location of one or more of the branches of the trigeminal nerve. Uh, it can often have a particular trigger, such as chewing, talking, brushing your teeth, uh, brushing it, putting your hair against a pillowcase or even wind on your hair. It can be miserable pain. It's also known as the suicide disease because the pain is so bad that people just, they choose to take their own life because the pain is so miserable. Uh, that needs to be differentiated from a typical neurodegenerative neuro neuro where the pain is a bit more consistent and there's more of a burning sensation. And it's thought to be basically short circuiting of the trigeminal nerve at the transition point between the oligodendrocytes sites of the brain and where it becomes a peripheral nerve, just as it leaves a brain stem here. That's what's called it's so called ephaptic transmission. And it's usually because there's a blood vessel pulsating against that, which causes some demyelination to occur. Uh, the main point with this is that you do need to do some imaging to rule out a structural lesion. 80 to 90% of the time, there will be an adjacent artery or even a vein. And there is a particular sequence called a CISR or Fiesta, which is 
basically a high resolution T2 scan. Uh, you do want to make sure they don't have multiple sclerosis because that's a slightly different beast. Microvascular decompression isn't likely to be helpful and they need to have that uh, investigated and managed by neurologists. Mm -hmm. If they have atypical symptoms, you really need to be aware that there can be mass lesions in the cerebral, what's called the cerebellopontine angle, uh, mm -hmm. which can cause those symptoms and you don't want to miss those. So this is an example of a Fiesta or a cyst scan. The patient had right-sided disease. So right trigeminal nerve, left trigeminal nerve. You can see there's this vessel right on top just where the nerve leads the brainstem here. And they had terrible headaches, which were improved with once that, um, what actually turned out to be the superior petrosal vein was contacting the nerve. Altered facial sensation, like I said, these are ones you don't want to miss. Uh, this was a patient referred to me a few months ago, a young lady in her twenties who had altered facial sensation. She had this large lesion in the posterior fossa, what's called a petroclival meningioma. Uh, these are actually extremely challenging uh, lesions from a surgical point of view. If they're much smaller than this, uh, you're actually better off having radio surgery to avoid any operations at all. Um, but at this point, that wasn't really an option. She had surgery, all went well. Uh, you can see the trigeminal nerve on the right-hand side is flopping around in the breeze. Uh, like I said, these are very challenging lesions. I don't think any surgeon really likes doing these operations because they can be quite long and dangerous and very, very unforgiving. And the point that I'm trying to make is that early detection is much better uh, because it will make a much easier time in regards to the treatment options. How to manage trigeminal neuralgia. Now, interestingly, it's actually mainly a medical disease. So often neurologists will look after this or even in the community. Uh, it actually responds really well um, to anti-epileptic anti -epileptic agents, particularly carbamazepine where the number needed to treat is two. I'm not sure in regards to baselines of other medications, but that's pretty impressive in regards to how successful that is. There are other neuro neuromodulators available, as you all know, um, which is a bit beyond the scope of what I can talk about. Surgical treatment, uh, there's a few options. The best treatment is actually to de directly decompress the nerve, as I alluded to earlier. And um, that's fairly risky because it's a very important part of the brain. And so the risk of a stroke or a hemorrhage can be devastating. The alternative in a patient who's medically unwell is to actually damage the nerve and actually coming through the front of the face, which at first glance looks a little bit horrific, but it's actually a fairly straightforward thing to do. It only takes about 15 minutes or so. And the idea is that we damage the nerve as it leaves the frame of Navali here. And you can do that in a few ways. I use a balloon to compress uh, the nerve and to basically cause a neuropraxia. You can burn the nerve with what's called a radio frequency ablation or some centers they poison the nerve with glycerol. In regards to the outcomes, uh, it's fairly well established in the neurosurgical literature that the best result is actually dealing with the underlying pathology. So if there's a vessel pulsating against the nerve, the best thing is actually to decompress that nerve and to relieve that pulsation. Uh, the success rate certainly isn't 100%, but pretty good at 87%, compared to about two thirds uh, with the ablative procedures. Complications are higher in regards to percutaneous procedures, but that's mainly in regards to numbness. Uh, the risk of anesthesia dolorosa or painful numbness is higher, which is a devastating complication to be completely honest, um, but it is a morbid procedure. And so certainly in an elderly patient, it's not such a good option. And the other thing to bear in mind is this is once all the uh, pharmacological treatments have been exhausted. So just to summarize in regards to which, uh, which patients should you be worried about and refer them to ED or um, just have imaging or can you just manage in the community? So the ones who really need to be sorted out quickly are the ones with neurological deficit or stroke-like symptoms. And I don't think I need to lecture anyone about that. I think that campaign has been done very well. Um, that time is brain. And often we'll get calls that a patient has a stroke call and they find a mass lesion. That's very straightforward. The sudden onset of thunderclap headache, uh, again, because the subarachnoid hemorrhage can be so devastating, particularly in regards to the risk of rebleed. If there's a concern of seizures or recent infection, uh, as you all know, bacterial infections generally progress without uh, active treatment. A recent head injury can, again, they can progress relatively uh, rapidly and can be life-threatening. And progressive symptoms, which are relatively rapid as a general rule, is something that should not be dismissed. When should they have outpatient imaging? So if someone has facial pain with trigeminal neuralgia, uh, particularly with the typical uh, trigeminal neuralgia, they should be investigated mainly to rule out other lesions. If there's concerns of uh, intracranial hypertension, uh, that can often be just managed as an outpatient. And if a lesion is found, referred as appropriately. If there's no lesion, um, it may just be simple measures to try to control that. If there's a history of malignancy, like I said, there's a quite a high rate of tumors. And so the yield is actually relatively high. And if the symptoms are slowly progressive, so most things in regards to pain and aches and what have you, 
get better with time. If something isn't getting better and if something is generally getting worse, that's a reason to up the ante. When to observe. So this is gonna be 90% of the time if they don't have any red flags. And the main thing is the primary headache disorders. So tension headaches are extremely common. Um, again, I don't need to lecture anyone here on how common they are and how to diagnose those. Uh, I think everyone here has probably had a tension headache at some point. Migraine is extremely common. If the migraine changes or is inconsistent, that would be a sort of concern, but often it is fairly typical. Cluster headaches are very unusual. And the last one to be aware of is medication overuse. So people who constantly take paracetamol or other painkillers, actually that in itself can cause a headache. And sometimes it's just a matter of weaning that medication and stopping it to try to relieve the headaches. Uh, so that's the last of my talk there. And I'll take a look at some of the questions here now. So I think there's a few uh, questions for Dr. Reddy first. Susan, how should we run this one? I think if you answer your questions first, and if Dr. Reddy's there, we can get him to answer his. Are you there, Dr. Reddy? Uh, yes, I am. Okay. Dr. Wilson, if you go first, that'd be great. Oh, Thank okay. You. Uh, so I think the first one for me is tinnitus and headaches. And so tinnitus is an extremely common symptom. I routinely get referrals from GPs and ENT surgeons who have done an MRI for a patient with tinnitus, and they haven't found anything related to the uh, vestibular cochlear nerve, but they found an aneurysm just by the epidemiology that aneurysms occur to three to four percent of the population. So I think with tinnitus, if it's uh, manageable and it's not pulsatile, I wouldn't be too fussed. If it's progressive, if it's uh, pulsatile, and certainly if it's keeping you awake at night, I think that would be a reasonable indication. And like I said, if the headaches are progressive, then that would be a very good reason to investigate. Um, that's actually a really difficult question. Um, I don't think the ENT surgeons have worked out what the right patient to scan with tinnitus is and how to manage that. Um, like I said, you kind of have to be guided by the other symptomatology more than anything else. In regards to Lyrica for trigeminalgia, I can't really answer that question. Um, I'm not a neurologist. I, from what I understand, Tegretol is the first line. Um, I can't understand why Lyrica would not be effective. Um, and certainly that would be an option. I guess probably the difference with Lyrica is you can actually increase the dose fairly highly beyond the usual 25 milligrams twice a day or 75 milligrams twice a day and again it comes down to measuring whether or not the side effects which are very hit and miss from what I've seen some patients have no side effects and good pain relief with Lyrica other patients have no relief from their particularly ridiculous pain but terrible side effects um, if cub me subpoenas failed that would be a reasonable option from what I can tell and in last dose for cub mazepin in trigeminalgia uh, I generally don't prescribe medications like carbamazepine. Um, so I would look at um, therapeutic guidelines that I don't want to tell people the wrong thing. And again, for cluster headache, again, that's more in the realm of uh, neurology rather than actual mass lesions per se. Uh, I, yeah, so I don't know if rapamil or gabapentin. Yeah, so the last question is a history of cord, a cerebral aneurysm and the complaint of headache. That's, the, that's actually a really, um, insightful question. So I think if someone who has a sudden onset of headache, um, independent of their history, you do have to be concerned. The concern with a coiled aneurysm, aneurysm is two things. One is that you can get recurrence, and we do know that the risk of recurrence with coiled aneurysms is actually higher than clipping, it's to the point that even though the risk benefit of coiling from an aneurysm, adrenal, aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage is better, um, they have done some uh, extrapolation of the data and found that patients under the age of 40 with a subarachnoid hemorrhage from aneurysm actually would be better off having a clipping of their aneurysm to minimize that risk long term. So there is a risk that they might have a recurrence. And strictly speaking, a coiled aneurysm should be surveyed by the interventionist who coiled that aneurysm. Um, the other concern is that if someone has an aneurysm, there is a lifetime risk of de novo aneurysm formation. And so they may have developed an aneurysm elsewhere on their cerebral circulation and that may have ruptured. So again, if they have a thunderclap headache, um, which is very intense and rapid onset, absolutely get a scan or send them to emergency. If they have general headaches, um, often it can be post subarachnoid hemorrhage. And so patients who have had int intracranial bleeding or postcraniotomy often get some irritation of the dura in regards to the scar tissue. And that can be a very difficult problem to solve. So I would say if it's, if it's manageable um, and it's not acute, then I wouldn't be too urgent about that. Uh, certainly, if someone says that the, the headache is unbearable, then you're more or less obliged to investigate. Okay, um, so I think it's Dr. Reddy's questions now. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Wilson, um, for speaking to us tonight. So Dr. Reddy, if you are able to answer those other questions, that would be great. Yeah, so look, um, we're going back to some treatment for back pain in terms of steroid. I'll start from the top. What's the role of prednisone for back pain? So look, I actually would not use prednisone for back pain on its own. Um, I would use a short pulse of um, an oral steroid for severe radiculopathy, particularly if there's a big herniated disc pinching on a nerve. I think um, a three-day course uh, is probably the most I would use to provide some sort of very systemic, anti, uh, strong anti-inflammatory. But I wouldn't use it just for back or for neck pain. Um, the next question comes back again to steroid injection. How often can be repeated for pain relief? Look, this is, um, this is an interesting question, a very common one, because a number of patients, I'm sure they come to you, and they certainly come to me saying that I've heard that I can only have a limited amount uh, over the course of my life. Um, look, I don't think that's quite true. Um, I think you have to balance how much benefit uh, you get versus um, the downsides. Now, cortisone is not as invasive as an operation. Um, usually it's done under CT guidance. So there's a small amount of radiation with the procedure. But the real downside with cortisone is that it's very variable in its effect and in terms of how effective it is and how long it lasts. So I've had patients that have uh, an excellent result for a day or two. I've had patients that have an excellent result for months. So usually what I tell patients is it comes down to your underlying pathology. If you need a cortisone injection once or twice a year, that's fine. If, you need, if you're only getting two weeks of relief, I don't think you should be having uh, injections every two weeks. You also have to factor in the patient themselves, their age. Um, you know, if you, there's, a very, uh, there's a big difference between treating a 60-year-old uh, versus a 95-year-old. A 95-year-old, you know, you're really going to be pushed trying to justify an operation in terms of uh, their medical condition and are they going to tolerate a general anaesthetic. So I don't have a certain, a, a definite number for steroid injection. To me, it's just that um, my general rules are, you know, no more than one every three months. Um, and Susanna has asked, uh, one of the red flags for spine pain is young age, less than 50. Um, look, the reason for that is that, you know, young people really shouldn't be getting a lot of back pain. Now, obviously, if you're a manual laborer and you're stacking bricks um, or something very physical repetitively day after day, yes, you're going to get some pain from that. Uh, but having said that, if that's the kind of job you're doing, you also, when you've seen these patients, you know, they build up the muscles, they build up the capacity. Um, and there's a bit of self-selection, you know, people that are not that physically, they probably don't gravitate towards physical jobs. So it's something that you, you should always just be a little bit worried about if uh, someone young comes in with a complaint of pain. A, a really good analogy is that patient that I described to you before, you know, a 56-year-old, motivated professional, very active, very sporty, comes in complaining of neck pain that's just not getting better. That, that should be a red flag that something else is going on. This is, the, this is an unusual symptom in this particular uh, age group. Um, now there's one other question. I'm happy to answer it, or I don't know whether Peter wants to answer it. I can give my version. Look, at this stage, you know, I think all of us are getting uh, overwhelmed with um, questions on COVID. Um, I hope I'm not being political, but I think there's been bad, um, uh, bad explanation from the politicians on vaccines. I've got a very simple answer to patients uh, in terms of vaccines. I usually tell them that there are a very small group of very specific contraindications, but in general, um, every medication, every vaccine has a risk of side effects. It, it can be very small, but there's a, there's a list. And the risk of a vaccine is probably far less than the risk of getting COVID. Um, that's the simplest way I tend to answer most of my questions. But, you know, P Peter also um, gets a lot of these and he may also have a take on uh, answering that question as well. Yeah, I would agree with, agree with Dr. Reddy that more or less it's, um, you have to look at longer term that the there may be some risk with the COVAX and particularly in individuals who are contraindicated per se, but Overall, the risk of um, morb morbidity, particularly neurological problems uh, such as death, is significantly higher if you have become infected with COVID than if you have the vaccination. Uh, there has been some updated um, data in regards to the AZ versus the Pfizer. Um, I don't have the reference at hand, but I think in the lands recently with very large numbers, they showed that the risk is actually more or less the same with the Pfizer and the AZ in regards to 
the thrombosis and so forth. So my general, uh, what I would say to patients, unless there is a very clear contraindication, they are far better off to have the vaccine than not. Thank you both very much for those extra questions. Okay, so now I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Pooja Arora, a rehabilitation and spinal medicine special, specialist, and she will be speaking on non-surgical management of cervical and cranial pain. Thank you. Hello everyone. And so my name is Pooja Arora. I'm the rehab physician and I work at Prince of Wales Hospital. Uh, can you all see my slides, Susan? Yes, we can. Lovely. Okay, so I'm going to talk about non-surgical management of neck pain and post-craniotomy headache. Look, often I wonder patients comes to your GP practice uh, with a neck pain. I thought the best way to find out how the pain is and how to triage is, is first thing, as everybody said, Raj and Peter, is to find out the red flag. Is it the emergency, like cervical cord compression, infection, or vascular emergencies? or something that can be further investigated in an outpatient setting or in a GP practice, like feature suggested of radiculopathy or neck masses like, you know, thyroid and all that uh, lymphadenopathy. And then to think about whom should we refer the patient? Does this patient needs a referral to a neurosurgeon or a neurologist, like some kind of a dystonia, neck pain, or a referral to a rheumatologist? neck pain with some limb girdle pain along with uh, other joint pains. I'm gonna focus now more about non-surgical management of neck pain. You often must have seen patients are, uh, complaining of disc problems or spondylosis. Uh, I have made a little small kind of a letter. So foremost thing is to, after your history and examination, uh, for those kind of radiculopathy patients. Uh, first thing is to manage their pain with the analgesics. Start with simple paracetamol, Celebrex, non-steroidals, and then consider opioids. Uh, I know there's a lot of discussion that has happened before regarding original injections, epidural injection, selective nerve root block, or facet joint injections. Second step, while you are managing pain, also talk about journal advice. Talk about quitting smoking. We know smoking leads to uh, microvascular ischemia of the disc and leads to further degeneration. Talk about correct posture. Talk about when there is a pain, a person should learn how to pace. Give them a natural history. Tell them what to expect. In majority of patients, the radiculopathy symptoms will improve. Now also look at the coping strategies. Talk about deep breathing exercises, distraction, whether this patient has ability for self-management and look for yellow flags as well, like any history of workers' comp or any secondary gains this patient has to get from this neck pain. Now coming to step three, in a patient who has got neck pain, simple thing to begin with is to each range of movement exercises. Now, usually there is a foraminal stenosis from the disc or the osteophytes. So simple thing is to do contralateral rotation and side flexion. Once the range of movement is in a pain-free and patient can do more, then talk about strengthening exercises. For radiculopathy pain, we mainly target cervical, scapular, and shoulder musculature. Um, we begin with isometric exercises. Isometric exercises means that the length of the muscle remains same during the activity. Once the patient can do that, then you go to isotonic exercises. It means that the load or attention is same, but there is a movement of the muscle or the joint involved. Now, along with your strengthening exercises is also important to look for journalized fitness. Look for aerobic reconditioning. You know, simple thing, how the patient is walking, bike, endurance exercises, to, so to overall improve the general well-being of the patient. 
So as I mentioned, isometric exercises, these are the isometric exercises we discuss with the patient. So to keep the muscle length same. I'm gonna show you a couple of exercises uh, and, and I would like to acknowledge my colleague and a physiotherapist who has volunteered to be my model. And this is a chin tuck. So this is for cervical muscles strengthening. This is chin tuck with extension. This is a kind of a stretches. You can see it's a trapezius stretch. I think in this time, ask the patients not to overdo it. And it's important that they hold the side of the chair so they are not putting too much pressure on the neck. This is called nerve gliding. So in this, you can see that the person is moving the arm, but the neck as well. So it's kind of helping the nerve to glide to the foramen. So any small adhesions that are developed secondary to inflammation, we can try to overcome that. Again, for scapular strengthening, you know, you all have seen that I, T, Y, and W exercises and prone line. And once patient can do that, then they can do a standing and use the weights as well, or also the pulleys to do a scapular strengthening exercises. While we are doing this, it's important in our education that we talk about work ergonomics to the patient. So often, this is the world we are living in. Everybody is on computer or texting or seeing their Instagrams. So when we are discussing about posture or work ergonomics, I often talk about that, look, when you are looking at your computer, your eyes should look at the top third of the screen. Your forearms should be parallel to the floor when typing. Your elbows should be by the side and feet should be flat on the floor and thighs should be parallel with the floor as well. Also with a standing posture as well. It's important when a person is standing, they shouldn't have a flexed neck. They should have a nice balanced um, posture where the shoulders and hips should align along with hips and ankles should align. And a person should place their feet apart and just have a little bit of a bend on their knees as well. Now, when we are sleeping, normally um, it's good to sleep when you have a neck pain on your back or on your side. Lying on your tummy and a prone positioning is not good for neck pain because in prone positioning, your neck is gonna get extended or so. When you're lying on the back, use a very kind of a thin pillow. It keeps your upper spine in a neutral position. When you are doing a side lying, then you should use a pillow that it's not too high that your ear is pushed towards your shoulder. I think the whole idea is to keep the spine neutral when sleeping as well. Now, um, say some patient who has required ACDF or some kind of a cervical surgery, it's important to manage their um, neck muscles and pain after surgery as well. So once they come to our rehab or in outpatient setting, we make sure the wound is nice and healthy. We talk about pain management, medications, non-steroidals, or sometimes um, neuropathic pain medications like Lyrica, Gabapentin, Emitriptyline. Um, there is a um, nice study, which is a pilot study, which was published last year. It showed that early self-directed home exercise program after ACDF uh, showed that patients were quite acceptable to start doing exercises um, early on day three or four after their ACDF. Um, and also their neck pain at six weeks as compared to the control groups was significantly better and the opioid use at one year was less. I know the numbers were quite small in this study, only 30 patients, but it was a kind of a pilot study which showed that patients were receptive 
uh, to start doing exercises. And the study showed that there were no adverse effects seen in those 15 patients who were randomized to do early exercises, like no hardware failure or bony fusion was affected. So it may tell us that we can consider something large trials to find out. Now, moving on to postcraniotomy headache. Uh, I know Peter has talked a lot about headaches. I think the key thing I'm going to focus is in our settings, we see patients in they, if they have a brain tumor surgery done or some kind of a brain surgery um, and if there are no red flags, then it's important to know that for diagnosis, they need to have craniotomy in the last seven days they have regained consciousness and they are not on any as some kind of sedatives or any medication that can affect their sensation to feel the pain. That would uh, be a diagnostic criteria for post craniotomy headache. Um, as we all know, in our practice, we always rule out red flags. Uh, I also look at the scar side to make sure there is no neuroma developing or wound site infection. If the headache persists after craniotomy for more than three months, then it can be considered as a persistent headache. And as Peter mentioned, then you need to consider about possibility of overuse headache. Um, in our rehab setting, we talk about pain management like scalp blocks, local anesthetics, get the pain team involved, all the medications which I've discussed before. Uh, Early mobilization is very important after surgery. The more they stay horizontal in the bed, the more they're gonna get deconditioned. Deep breathing exercises, endurance, fatigue management after such a big surgery, cognitive and physical impairments we target, depending upon what behavioral issues, what cognitive issues they have, we deal with those. And if they have any hemiplegia or sensory loss or any issues with gait, then we do gait retraining and target those specific impairments. Along with that, it's important for patients to have some kind of independence. So equipment, and we also talk about social support, whether they fulfill the criteria for NDIS or not. So I'm going to share my experience with you. Uh, one of uh, my patients, Mr. MS, he had symptoms of pain and paresthesias in, uh, on his left arm. He was 57-year-old mining engineer. He worked very hard and he was diagnosed with cervical radiculopathy. He worked very hard and did all the exercises which we asked him to do, but pain didn't improve. Um, his MRI scan showed radiculopathy due to disc prolapse compressing the C8 nerve root. So he was referred for a neurosurgical opinion. He underwent C7 to T1 decompression in February 2021. Uh, along with his post-op rehab, we also managed his return to work. So his job description included, as I mentioned, he's a mining engineer, that his most of the time he used to spend on a desk, which is like doing design work, doing meetings, organizing rosters for his juniors. And when he has to go underground for underground inspection, he had to wear a full PPE with a helmet, with the cap lights, um, and he had to wear goggles. He had to walk on a uneven terrains, humid environment. So we begin with the gradual return to work. For first couple of weeks, he managed with just desk-based job. And after three months, when the surgeon was happy that his um, post-op x-rays looked fine, he was allowed to go on a normal duties. Um, he was quite happy um, that his pain improved. He returned back to his normal duties. He now only has just mild paresthesias in his left arm. He's off Lyrica now as well. Um, now his permanent restrictions from the surgeon is lifting restriction to 20 kgs and he should avoid heavy and repetitive tasks. Other important things, simple things, but they do make a difference. I had a patient who was always on his um, iPad while waiting for day rehab. Uh, so, and he used to come for a teaching, for a training sessions for his neck pain. And we noticed he's always head down looking on his iPad. So we, so we talked about iPad mounts 
and stands. And also there is a new app coming, something to consider like uh, it's called text me app um, where you can see that if a patient has a not a good posture, the red flag will be displayed on the phone. So it's on a, a real time patient will know that, okay, my posture is wrong. I have to correct it right now. So coming to my last slide, take home messages, know the likely cause for pain, talk about pain management options, pharmacological, and then go to non-pharmacological as well, which is like doing exercises, starting with range of movement, strengthening exercises, see how patient is going, pro how patient is progressing. If there are any barriers and if there are no improvement happening, then dial a friend and refer to a specialist. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aurora. Um, I think there is a question there. Is that question for you? In the so, question box. Susanna, your question is for neuropathic pain. Which one is better, gabapentin or Lyrica slash pregabalin? Look for post spinal pain. Now we have a level one evidence that Lyrica is um, definitely far better. But this is, but I feel we have to do patient selection. I have seen in my professional career that patients who are on Lyrica, their cognitive side effects could be more. So patients who are elderly and they have more chances of getting delirium, I start them on a gabapentin. Also for post spinal pain, gabapentin is not on PBS and Lyrica is on the PBS. So I think that's also the reason that it becomes easier for patients pocket. So that's why we are writing more Lyrica. But um, often I find gabapentin has got a good effect as well. Thank you. Do we have any more questions for Dr. Aurora that we could put in the chat, uh, in the Q&A box very quickly? Do you have any anything further to say on your topic, Dr. Aurora, while we're waiting for questions? Yeah, I think I would like to say that, um, as everybody mentioned, that see how patient is progressing, look for the red flags. And if patient is improving, that's well and good. But if there are any kind of a barriers, then always keep your antennas open and make sure that you're not missing anything. And also, if you know about the natural history of the disease, then reassure the patient what to expect. So it becomes easier for them to deal with. Okay, we have another question coming in from Dr. Magali. Do you have a room around St. George area? Uh, so Susan, I work with... Uh, Raj and Peter at Prince of Wales Hospital. Uh, so I share the room suite three as well. And in public, I work at Prince of Wales Hospital. Do we have any other questions? If you could put them quickly into the Q&A box, that would be great. We'll just give it another minute. And um, while we're um, waiting, I'd just like to thank all of you for presenting tonight and giving us your time. It's been very informative. So we'll just give that one more minute and then we will ask Dr. Martina Gleason from Health Pathways to come on and give us a quick Health Pathways update. So it doesn't look like there are any more questions, but we can always quickly come back to them after uh, Dr. Gleason. So thank you very much, Dr. Aurora. Uh, Dr. Gleason, if you'd like to present, that would be great. Thanks very much, Susan, for inviting us. Um, rather than a particular update, this is just letting everybody know which health pathways are uh, relevant to tonight's presentation. So uh, hopefully you're familiar with health pathways and if you aren't, um, I'm happy to uh, present it uh, in more depth to your small group learning um, or in a session. But uh, we now have Sydney and Southeast and Sydney Health Pathways teams support trying to support care 24-7. Um, and because we're both in the same PHN, uh, we've come to an arrangement so that you can use the same login to access both sets of pathways. Um, so if you are 
have not logged into Health Pathways before, if you um, shine your uh, webcam at the QR code, you'll be able to log into the pathway or just take a photo of the slide so that you can see the web address to have a look around when um, you're back in your rooms or when you're at home. And you'll also see the login details for Southeastern Sydney. The username is SC Sydney. The password is healthcare. Uh, for Sydney, uh, the username, I can't see. Um, but uh, it's on the on the display for you. And you can use the same username and password for between the two pathways. So you can log in to Sydney pathways using the Southeast Sydney um, login. So the benefit of that is that Sydney's been going for a longer time. So they have more pathways, but uh, the benefit of the Southeast and Sydney pathways is that the referral information is about our area, our neck of the woods. So you'll be able to find Prince of Wales clinics and St George clinics, Sutherland clinics and private practitioners who work in our area. Uh, the pathways that we currently have that are relevant to chronic pain include chronic pain, medications in chronic pain, chronic pain specialised assessment, which is your chronic pain clinics, um, both private and public, and pain management in palliative care. And we actually have quite a lot more in development. We're just in the process of setting up a working party and we've got about seven pathways that we want to start developing that all have the, the common theme of pain. Um, Sydney Health Pathways have uh, neuropathic pain, which they're currently reviewing, headaches in adults, pain management assessment, trigeminal neuralgia, facial palsy, chronic non-cancer pain and interventions in chronic pain, which are currently being reviewed, and codeine, chronic use and deprescribing, which is probably quite relevant to a few years ago when they rescheduled re um, codeine. Uh, these are contact details if you have any questions or feedback. And I just want to point out this little icon here, the blue circle with the text um, inside it. Uh, there's one of them on every pathway. So if you want to send feedback saying there's a broken link or this was really helpful or I think this is out of date, have you considered? Um, you can just click on that link and, um, and it will help you find it. Um, what I wanted to do now was just um, have a, um, sorry, um, I wanted to show you a live demonstration seeing that we've got a tiny bit of time um, of what Health Pathways looks like. And so if you were, this is the Southeast Sydney front page on the desktop. Um, and if you were looking say for pain, you can either type it into, um, the text box up there and it will give you a bunch of um, options. So if I click on pain management requests, it will take me through to that pathway where I will be able to find what the criteria are for sending to the chronic pain clinics and then find how to actually you know, there's uh, whether there's a specific referral form, um, how to refer and um, how to access um, the information that I need if I don't already have it in my in my database on my clinical software. So, and the names of the people that are involved. Uh, the alternative way of searching is to try and use the um, table of contents. And in this case, uh, pain management is under medical. Um, and so if you scroll down and you can see pain management there. Uh, if you can see here, the 